All right, try to do this video one more time here. Uh, what I got here is a bunch of parts for a refrigeration project I have coming up. Um, I talked a bit yesterday about the uh, these AC compressors. I want to mention those here in a moment. Um, I uh, this is kind of the culmination of several years of of interest in refrigeration and um, reading a lot of antique refrigeration books. Um, they are really are a wealth of knowledge. Um, uh, obviously the um, the, some of the components have uh, changed drastically, but the basic principles have not. Um, the refrigerants have changed, but again, the basic principles associated with them have not. Uh, my uh, my greatest fascination has been with uh, not industrial refrigeration, but in domestic refrigeration, the the evolution of the um, the refrigerator, uh, the ice box, um, and then you know def eventually the absorption refrigeration system and the vapor compression in the household. In the 20s and 30s, these, uh, these machines were beautiful. They were amazing. They were belt-driven. They were noisy. They used a lot of energy. They uh, sometimes leaked out their toxic refrigerants and killed the whole family. Um, it's happened. Um, but today, refrigerants are definitely safer for, uh, for people, for the occupants of the home, um, although they're not as uh, good for the atmosphere. Um, you know, that is slowly changing. Um, my refrigerant of choice right now is barbecue grade propane. Um, I choose this because it is cheap. Um, if I vent a little bit of it, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not really out anything. It, uh, has almost no global warming potential. Um, I'm not consuming it. I'm recirculating it and reusing it. Um, I don't need a license to, to use it. Um. It doesn't take some nasty chemical process to produce it. It's a natural product. Um, but the difference between this propane and um, uh, the R290, the you know real propane, the pure propane uh, substance, is um, the quality of this it varies greatly. Um, you know, I've read some numbers. There's always a little bit of water. Um, 9 or 10% propylene. Um, which behaves pretty closely to propane, I believe, um, and then the rest, you know, propane, maybe a little butane or something in there. Um, R290, the pure stuff, is used in uh, uh, a lot of domestic appliances in Europe. Um, they have a little more stringent um, uh, environmental controls over there, and um, uh, they've been using this stuff for a couple years, maybe a lot longer than that, I really don't know. Um, we almost never use it here in the states that I'm aware of. There might be a few new cases, but um, we are, um, you know, DuPont people over here, I guess. So, anyhow, anyhow, um, I'm using propane um, because, uh, well, just, just for shits and giggles, whatever. So, um, those old refrigerators, by the way, uh, this air compressor, I thought this was pretty neat looking. And a lot of the compressors in those old uh, refrigerators looked a lot like this. Um, uh, but I'm not using that. I explained yesterday that that thing leaks too bad. It cannot be used for refrigeration compressor. So we're using the old York. Um, this thing came out of it. Came out of an 83 Volvo. Um, splash lubricated. Oil's in the base down here. It's two cylinder, 10.3 cubic inch. This thing has flange adapters. This thing has roto lock. Um, any more information? If you want more information about that. Uh, shoot me a comment, check out my other video, there's some uh, links in the information section there. So, ultimately, what I want to do with uh, this project is um, uh, get a lot more hands-on experience with refrigeration, um, test out a few different ideas, um, um, get a real hands-on experience because this thing's going to be variable speed, um, my refrigerant control is going to be a throttling valve, which is this quarter-inch needle valve, um, which will give me the ability to... Uh, manually control you know, suction pressure both with the uh, speed of the compressor and with the throttling valve I'll have a um, uh, controllable water line that will uh, control the flow rate to the, uh, the uh, water cooled condenser um, and a few other things in there that I can I can play around with um, so I really want to build a uh, pedal powered ice machine been wanting to do it for a couple of years um, just curious how much can I produce? You know, one hour, me pedaling, or rowing, or whatever, you know, input mechanism I decide to use. Um, honestly, I think I can produce a couple pounds, but um, let's see if I can actually meet with some of my uh, back-of-the-envelope uh, calculations. Um, so, initially, what I want to do is just build a basic layout 
um, and get my hands dirty a little bit. Um, it's going to be motor driven. My prime mover is this um, two and a quarter horsepower DC motor. Um, this is a treadmill motor. It's pretty beefy. It's a little overkill for what my application is, but it gives me variable speed uh, to ultimately figure out what the uh, speed range that I want on this thing so that I have a better idea uh, what kind of transmission I'm going to need between uh, me, my pedals, my flywheel, and the compressor. So, um, this thing's going to have service valves on the top of it. Uh, they're ordered. I'm, I'm waiting to get those in. So, um, that'll be a, a half inch flare. So, I'll have to adapt that to um, my high side is going to be a quarter inch, um, quarter inch line, a copper line, and my low side is going to be a three eighth inch line. Uh, I might change that um, down the road, but it's a good st starting point. So, got a lot of um, uh, quarter inch and three eighth inch. Um, fittings and um, what else we got here so we're going to come out of the old compressor and go right into the condenser I don't have the condenser to demonstrate for you right here but essentially what it's going to be is a length of quarter inch copper tubing made into a coil uh, the uh, high side um, uh, hot gas is going to enter into the top of the coil water is going to uh, cool it and condense it and it's going to drain out the bottom uh, there's going to be, it's, the whole thing's going to be housed inside of a PVC or ABS pipe uh, vertically, going to have a cap on the bottom and a clean out plug on the top. Um, I'll be able to circulate water through there utilizing a pump out of a, some kind of a tank. Uh, eventually might play around with um, <clears throat> um, evaporative cooling uh, on the condenser water so I don't have to use a lot of water. Um, and uh, there's some other interesting uh, uh, things I want to do with condensers down the road. Um, so out of the old condenser and on to the receiver. It's a very, very large receiver, but on the way to the receiver, um, high side pressure gauge, um, which might exist before the receiver or after, I'm not sure. Uh, we also have a, uh, a sight glass, quarter inch uh, flare, moisture indicator, sight glass, looking for old bubbles. Make sure we're getting pure uh, liquid coming out of the old condenser. Um, filter dryer, beefy, big. Plenty, dirty, dirty refrigerant, dirty refrigerant, um, and then on to the uh, the the um, receiver. Sorry, um, <clears throat> this thing was actually pretty cheap. Um, new old stock, uh, quarter inch fittings. Uh, it does have a uh, nice service valve on one side. I'm going to have to actually sweat service valve on the other side so that I can uh, uh, segregate the whole thing. I can. You know, for one thing, I have the receiver to, to ensure that, you know, pure liquid is moving on to the throttling valve. Um, but um, I wanted a nice, good, large receiver because um, I'd like to reuse it for other projects. Um, but uh, I can store a lot of refrigerant in it. So, you know, I can close down my, my throttling valve and, uh, you know, cool my condenser sufficiently and keep the system running and pump all the refrigerant in the system into the receiver. Um, because I will have a large charge in the system as, as a whole because, as I'll explain in a moment, the evaporator is going to have quite a bit of refrigerant in it. So that will allow me to, to pump everything into the receiver and work on other parts of the system as I see fit. Um, <clears throat> out of the receiver, we're moving on to the, um, the throttling valve, which this is a quarter-inch needle valve. Um, manually controlled. I think a lot can be learned from having a manually controlled receiver. Uh, excuse me, throttling valve. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to a TXV <coughs> or um, even like a stepper motor controlled um, uh, valve. I, th those are fine devices, I'm sure, in the correct application. Um, but, you know, in the past I had some old dehumidifiers uh, a few years ago that I played around with. Um, they leaked, or they had leaked out. They didn't work anymore. People gave them to me. I found them. Um, so, ditched the capillary tube because, well, what fun is that? And it's not designed for the refrigerant that I'm using, the propane. Um, so um, instead put a uh, flow control valve in and it worked just fine. A uh, buddy of mine recommended it and even gave this one to me. Um, worked out great. Um, I learned a lot from it. Had a lot of fun with it. Uh, the filter dryer kit, I got that online somewhere. Um, because again, dirty fuel. Propane. Or refrigerant, excuse me. So. Um... So, like I said, I explained the, the needle valve. I'm going to give that a shot, see how it works. Um, 
and then uh, out through my throttling valve uh, into my evaporator. Now, my, my evaporator, I don't have to demonstrate for you here yet because I have not built it yet. It's going to be a big brazing project, and it's going to probably be a test of my patience. It's going to be a flooded evaporator, and not flooded in the sense that um, you have a flooded, or excuse me, a coil, um, uh, evaporator coil that um, is flooded in the sense that it has <clears throat> um, just enough refrigerant to uh, to boil off, you know, considering the heat of the cabinet or, or whatever medium you're, you're cooling, um, and uh, goes back in a saturated state. No, it's flooded in the sense that it's essentially going to be a large reservoir that is filled, well, mostly filled, uh, with liquid, low temperature, uh, low pressure refrigerant. Now, just like this tank here, uh, this is empty right now, but uh, you can imagine if you've ever used a lot of propane out of a, uh, a small bottle, uh, whenever you relieve the pressure off the top, the static pressure that exists over the liquid that's sitting down here, now remember this, this propane boils at around negative 44 degrees Fahrenheit at atmospheric pressure, but inside of this tank, say right now it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the pressure in here might be 100 PSI. Um, so whenever you relieve the pressure off the top, the static pressure uh, goes lower than the vapor pressure of the, the liquid, and those uh, molecules of propane uh, begin to change change phase and start to get excited, and whenever they change uh, state from a liquid into a gas, um, they boil. And when they boil, they it requires, I think it's like 144 BTU per pound of that liquid changing phase. Um, and it cools, and it absorbs heat from the environment, gets all frosty and stuff. I think most people can relate to that, have had experience with that. And that occurs until um, the static pressure rises to the point where that boiling stops. The static pressure gets risen uh, above the vapor pressure, or equal to the vapor pressure, and at which point that boiling slows to a stop and eventually halts, um, at which point it no longer uh, absorbs any more heat. If you slowly relieve the pressure, this will boil at a very, very low rate. And the, te the temperature difference between the liquid boiling in this tank and the um, outside environment is very small. So if you don't have much surface area, you're not going to get much heat transfer across it. However, if you relieve the pressure off of it very quickly, say for instance, if you're pumping uh, vapor with a compressor, and the pressure gets very, very low, it will boil violently. And when it boils violently, it will absorb massive amounts of heat uh, through those walls. So, ideally, you don't want a very extremely low, uh, uh, low pressure um, to exist there. Um, simply because the lower pressure, the more work that the compressor has to do. And the less dense the vapor is, whenever it enters the, uh, the piston on the suction stroke. Um, which means if it's less dense, there's less mass, because gas has mass, and when it less, has less mass, there's less um, total fluid flow through the compressor. And there's a bunch of other things related to volumetric efficiency that you're hurting. I won't go into that right now, but um, the only reason you would want to do that is if you want to increase the refrigerative capacity of the system you have. You'd run it faster, you'd have a lower pressure on the suction side, and it would get a lot colder a lot faster because you have limited surface area. However, if you increase the surface area of that tank, say by adding little 3 8 inch lines that come out and come back out to the bottom, have liquid sitting in them as well, um, they are boiling as well and adding to the surface area um, and are able to absorb more heat at a higher suction pressure. Um, so, anyway, I basically just described what my ebulator is going to be. Um, and, and if you ever look up, um, and there's some pictures on my blog, with some of these old antique refrigeration books, a lot of the old domestic refrigerators had uh, what's called a, a, a low side um, gravity float or low side gravity float flooded evaporator. Now, usually, they would have a horizontal tank, and um, coming off of that tank would be, um, I think a lot of times these were steel actually, um, lines that would extend out and down the bottom and back up, and and they would have uh, a liquid off of this this header and this header will be maintained at a level appropriate for the system. Liquid refrigerant would be injected in the top and the suction line would also pull um, refrigerant off of the top. 
what maintained the liquid level in there because if you continued to run the compressor and the liquid boils, evaporates, and is carried away back to the compressor, eventually your liquid level is going to drop to the point where you, now you have a dry, completely dry evaporator and um, um, you have a limited surface area because uh, very little of the, the copper steel lines are actually exposed to wet refrigerant. Um, so the mechanism that these usually used, at least in the early days, was a low side float. It was literally just like a float that you'd have in a uh, in a toilet tank, except it's designed for uh, a little more hazardous of an environment, and it had to be pretty reliable. And a lot of times they did stick, and they had problems. Um, they would have a <clears throat> a gasket and a uh, a plate on the front a lot of times to service it. Some of the nift gear ones actually didn't require that you you uh, uh, evacuate the evaporator to, to service the uh, the actual valve, usually a little needle or something that was controlled by a float. Um, and then later ones used a, a, a high side float system, but they still had a, a more or less a flooded evaporator. So, um, like I said, I basically just described the evaporator I'm going to have. Now, the way that I'm going to um, regulate the amount of refrigerant in it is I need a sight glass. Now, initially, I actually bought these suckers. Big two inch pipe thread, stainless steel, Supposed to be good for 500 psi, uh, but they're all boogered up. Got shipped to me. Got all messed up. I might be able to clean them up and use them later, but I was actually going to use two of these, the two-inch pipe in between, to actually be able to look down the length of the header and maintain the liquid somewhere in the middle. So I'm not going to use those right now. Maybe at a later date. I'm going to use another one of these um, moisture indicators. This is three-eighth inch flare, and it's just going to be designed so that say if this were my header, it's not going to be. My header is going to actually be a, a one inch copper pipe and some three-eighth inch copper tubing. Um, and one of those lines that I described that come off it just to increase the surface area is just going to have one of these installed in it. And whatever height I decide the liquid I want it to be for the design of the system, I'm just going to put one of these suckers in there and at least I'll have one window into the height of the liquid. <clears throat> my only concern is that um, if the boiling becomes too violent, um, it'll be harder to maintain, or harder to actually get a good indication of what the liquid level is in there. Um, because, you know, you get a lot of bubbles and, you know, a violent boiling and stuff. Might even find that I have to insulate that line or something just to, or slow the system down and check the, the, the liquid level or something. I, I don't know, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. But um, that's going to be a big test of my patience, just brazing that project up. And then, uh, you know, that evaporator, since I'm probably going to have to do some servicing on it, I don't want to have to remove, um, uh, I, sh I should be able to valve off without actually putting valves around the evaporator, but if I decide to, I got these nifty ball valves for pretty cheap, um, two of them, and they shouldn't restrict flow at all, so I definitely don't want to restrict flow on the low side. Anyway, from the ebulator um, is a short and straight run as I can back to the, the suction on the evaporator to um, keep superheat to a very, very minimum. Um, and if I do have a little bit of wet compression, well, compressors are 52 bucks and I can rebuild them. So, you know, if I end up trashing some valves or something, um, it could be interesting. But... Um, yeah, there's a few other, there's a there's a lot of other things. I could talk for hours about this crap, and if you sat through this whole thing, you can probably imagine I could ramble on for quite a long time. So, um, oh, of course, a low side pressure gauge as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's about all I have to say right now. Um, in a few days, I should have some service valves for this. I'm going to pump a little bit of uh, liquid from one tank to another, just to see how she goes, um, and get my hands dirty a little bit. And um, once I actually have uh, suction or suction discharge service valves for one of these compressors, I'm going to start laying out the whole system and uh, build my condenser, build my evaporator, put the whole damn thing together, and uh, see how she goes. So I will make a few more videos as I go along, so I don't have to make them all this long. Um, anyway, thanks for watching.